everyone. And I just want to say thank you, Pat, for giving me the opportunity to come here today and speak to you guys about Cabas. That is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, just a little bit about myself, my background. I started as a BI here in the Lower Mainland. Oh, 20 years, is it 20 years? Oh, oh my gosh, yes. So at that time I was an undergrad at SFU and I started working with uh, a couple of the consultants who came back here who completed the program at Teachers College in Columbia University, New York. So I was you know, quickly in love with the CABA system and I decided to pursue my master's and doctorate degrees there. Um, so I, I spent about eight years in New York, so I was fully immersed in the CABA system. Uh, I worked throughout my master's and doctorate and then I did a postdoc a little bit there. And I am currently practicing as a behavior analyst here in the Lower Mainland uh, for students diagnosed with ASD, ranging for, you know, from two to about 18 years old. Uh, just an overview of today, we're gonna be talking about, you know, an overview of the CABA system, what the learn unit is, the decision protocol that we use, and characteristic practices of teaching as applied behavior analysis. So, what is CABAS? Like, uh, like the title says, it's Comprehensive Application of Behavior Analysis to Schooling. It is a system of education for all children. Uh, it was originated to develop a science of teaching. Um, and the original goal was to develop schools based entirely on the use of scientific procedures for classroom management, pedagogy, curriculum design, staff training, and parent education. And I will mention this several times throughout my presentation that everything we do is learner driven, right? Like the student is always right. That is sort of what we uh, practice, like what, what our practice is based on is that the student is always right. So everything we do is based on how the student is doing. And if the student is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, it is us as the, their teacher or instructor or the behavior analyst, it is up to us to fix that. So we can never say that, well, the student can't learn, we'll talk more about that, uh, but we have to shift our mindset and you know, keep that in mind that the student is always right. Um, everything is measurement based, so it's individualized education for entire classrooms and entire schools driven by what worked for each individual child. Again, you'll hear me saying that quite a bit. Learner driven, student is always right, and that's the basis of CABAS. Just a bit of a background on the Cabas affiliated schools. There's several in, mostly in the New York and New Jersey. So the Fred S. Keller School is the preschool that I worked at uh, after I graduated. It is a preschool for students diagnosed with ASD and developmental disabilities. Uh, we serve early intervention. So I had students who were as young as 16 months old in that school uh, up to students who were about to enter kindergarten, so about five years old. Um, and then we also are affiliated with the Morristown Public School District. So in this school district, we had classrooms, we had a segregated classroom, and then we had K to five, and these are all general education, um, accelerated learner independent model. So the students with autism in these classrooms are all fully included, and the rest of the classrooms are typically developing students. Uh, but we still use the CABA system with all of the learners in the classroom. Uh, we also have district-based elementary classrooms at the Rockland BOCES. So these are, I think in, in New York State, it's just a little different. There's a lot of, I guess, what it would be called here, low-incidence classrooms. So there's separated, segregated classrooms within the district-based elementary schools. So we had several of those. And then there is also the phase on school for autism in Virginia, which uh, serve obviously for individuals with autism from early intervention elementary up to adult day programs and residential programs. It's a great school. And in England, we have the Jigsaw England, uh, which also serve the elementary and high school students diagnosed with ASD. So there's quite a bit of uh, schools that are affiliated right now. In terms of the university affiliation, we have Teachers College Columbia University as the sort of the main school. Uh, these are teaching, you know, the program is in teaching as applied behavior analysis. Um, it's housed in the Department of Health and Behavior Studies and uh, we have MA, ED, and PhD students in there. 
we are also affiliated with Nicole's University in Louisiana. So that's another university that has an online program as well. So what is the, <coughs> excuse me, what is the basis of CABAS? Like everything we do is from, we know from the research on behavioral analysis and education. There's really nothing new. It's just picking sort of those components that have been successful and putting them into one, one big system. So we know already that behavior analysis and the science of behavior could contribute to school and academic success. We have been successful in isolating causes of learning problems, focusing on mastery learning, and then we, we have been successful in finding ways to bridge research and practice. So we know already there are many behavioral practices that have been shown to be successful in teaching students and improve learning. So some of these are direct instruction curriculum with a capital D and capital I, precision teaching technology, program instruction, um, personalized system of instruction that was developed by uh, Keller and Ogden Lindsay and all of those people, right? So this is a huge history of behavior analysis and education. So within that, when we look at the pedagogy, it's not only presentation of the materials, we're not only looking at that, but we're also looking into the teaching operations provided by a teacher or a teaching device, which could be like a computer or an app, whatever it is, that results in new student repertoires. So when we use behavior analysis in education, we are not only looking into reducing problem behaviors, right? Sometimes I feel, um, those who are not as familiar with ABA, for example, would identify the use of behavior analysis procedures to reduce problematic behaviors, but we could also improve learning and teach new repertoires to replace those problem behaviors. So within the schools in the Kava system, we're not only reducing problem behaviors, but the focus is to improve and increase learning for our students. Um, with that said, we need to identify what is working for our students and what creates the change, right? So when we're presenting instruction, we need to keep in mind all the time what is successful for this particular individual um, and how do we go about to maintain the success in learning, right? Or the increase in learning and how do we reduce problem behaviors at the same time? So learning occurs because of what we do as teachers or instructors or behavior analysts. I use the term teacher quite loosely as in someone who provides instruction. So I always consider myself as a teacher. Um, and I know that what my student does or whatever their learning is directly related to what I do as the instructor providing the instruction. So that's what we need to keep in mind. So learning occurs as a function of the instructional operations. Right? It's learning just doesn't occur magically. It occurs because we alter the environment. We change what we do to produce that learning. And of course, it's demonstrated by data. So we'll talk more about that too. What are the major characteristics of CABAS? Again, it's comprehensive, individualized instruction. So everything is individualized for the students. Uh, new conceptions of curriculum and pedagogy based on the epistemology of behavior selection. So we apply tactics or techniques that have been shown to be successful in research and uh, tied to the basic principles of behavior. It, it is again, a system-wide perspective that is learner-driven, right? Everything is based on what the student does. We set educationally and socially significant objectives. Uh, we are schools that prime a sense of community, so there's parent training within the school. We train the teachers to work with the students, and then there's supervisors that work with the teachers, and then there's the university component to go with that. Uh, we are trying to redesign schools based on the individual and the science of applied behavior analysis. Uh, it is a system that works because there's continuous measurement of the important behaviors of each member of the system. And you'll see later on too that we not only take data on the students, we take data on the teachers, we take data on the supervisors. Like, there's just a lot of data generated and that helps uh, increase the efficiency of the student learning. And teachers, and we have teachers, again, teachers or instructors uh, who function as strategic scientists of instruction. The CABA system includes, of course, the pedagogy and the curricula, it includes supervision, it includes the administration, the roles of the students, parents, teachers, supervisors, and the university training program. And again, student is at the center of instruction. Everything we do is based on our students. 
and incorporates the entire breadth of behavior analytic research in addition to its own research. These are basically the components of CABAS. Due to time, I can talk about all of these probably in, a, in an eight-hour workshop. I only have an hour and a half today. So today, I'm just going to focus on the student aspect and the teachers and you know, how that's tied within the system. The students who are in the CABAS schools or CABAS system are categorized based on levels of verbal behavior. So we, in the Fred S. Keller school, I think that really shows the, the sort of the true CABAS system. Students, um, the three to five year olds are all in the one area of the school and the early intervention, just because the way it works, they have to be in their own uh, classroom. But the students are not grouped based on age per se, they're actually grouped based on the levels of verbal behavior. So we categorize the students, whether they're a pre-listener, pre-speaker, listener, speaker, and, and all of this. And I'll give you a bit of a description of each. So a student who is considered a pre-listener is basically a student who is fully dependent on others. Uh, they don't have any listener repertoire. Uh, these are students that you might find require a lot of uh, physical prompting. So for example, if you're telling the student, come here, they probably require you to hold their hand and bring them over to where you want them to be. If you ask them to sit down, they probably require like some sort of prompting towards the chair or guiding them to sit down. So these are students who I will say do not have learner readiness skills. They don't know how to sit down. They don't have any listener repertoire at all. They are not able to follow any focal directions. So early, early learners. Um, it doesn't matter though how old they are. I have, for example, some students here who are in second or third grade that I'm working with right now who I would still categorize as pre-listener even though they've been in intervention for some time, right? Whereas a student who is a listener, so I'm just gonna jump a little bit there, is a student who is still dependent but some directions can be delivered verbally, right? So if I tell them, you know, like find find your nose, they're able to touch their nose. Um, they can follow directions delivered by others um, and they don't require as much physical prompting as a student who is categorized as a pre-listener. Uh, so students who are listener might be working on things like following focal directions, identifying objects, finding things in the environment and things like that and they would be able to, to learn those skills. Now, a student who is a pre-speaker, as you could imagine, is someone who is not yet able to communicate their wants and needs, right? There, there is no uh, communication in any way. So I think you might, been, you, know, might, you might have been working with these types of students where you know, when they want something, then they emit uh, you know, behaviors that are not as functional but still get what they want. So these are students who don't have any communication. Um, whereas a speaker is a student who can manipulate the environment by using others to mediate the contingencies. So if I say, oh, it's so hot in here, and then somebody might go and open the window for me. So clearly I'm a speaker because I'm able to um, manipulate the environment so that I can say, you know, I can tell you what I want and what I need um, and things like that. So. So a student who is a speaker also uses his own verbal behavior to govern others, like I said. So these are usually students who are also able to label things in the environment, right? If I look outside and I say, oh my gosh, it's so rainy outside. So like I'm able to tact uh, the environment and kind of get social attention that way. Now a student who is what we call speaker as own listener is a student who is able to do both. So these are students who are able to have conversations, right? In order to have a conversation with other people, you need to be able to listen to what another person is saying, right? And then you need to be able to respond. So now you're a listener and you're also a speaker. So if I were to ask Leah here, for example, Leah, where do you live? Vancouver. Oh, I live in Burnaby, so I am a speaker and a listener within, within the self. So a student who's able to do that usually has achieved uh, significant independence and they can function as a listener to his or her own verbal behavior. There's, uh, what, everything we do is also based a lot on Skinner's verbal behavior. So you'll see me using a lot of the terminologies uh, within that. So if you have any questions at any time about some of the Phoebe that I'm using, just ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. Um, a student who is a reader is 
obviously a student who is able to read and is able to be affected by what they are reading. So reading, everything we do, there's a function to it, right? If based on Skinner's verbal behavior theory, everything, uh, it, there's a function to what we do. So reading doesn't necessarily just mean you look at a text and read it out loud, but can you be affected by what you're reading? If you're reading a set of directions, can you follow those directions? If you're reading to evoke you know, sadness, like let's say you're reading a sad novel, do you cry when you read? Like when you're reading something funny, do you laugh? So like that's all being like the function of uh, reading. And same thing with being a writer, is not only are you s supposed to be able to write structurally, right, in good grammar, good sentence and all of that, but can you then affect others through your own writing? We always look at the function of that. So a student who is categorized as a reader and a writer uh, should be able to follow, uh, should be able to do all of those things. And then we also have self-editors who are able to self-manage own behaviors. So I, to be honest with you, in my years teaching at, I was at Morristown for a bit uh, with the second graders. So a lot of those students are basic, you know, probably reader, writer, but I, like they don't become self-editors usually until much older. That's when you're able to edit, like you're able to identify your own reinforcers, you're able to self-manage your own behaviors, you're able to sort of edit your own work, and that takes, that requires a lot of skills. And the reason why we do this, uh, we do group the students based on the categories of verbal behavior. And when we also do sort of data presentations on our students, it's very easy for us to identify what level the student is on. So if I were to say, okay, so this student is a pre-listener speaker level of verbal behavior, I think uh, you know, then all of us in the group or in the room are able to identify, oh, okay, pre-listener, so probably not able to follow directions, a speaker may, probably has some mans and tax in their repertoire, so. Okay. So we assign multiple labels of these. They're not like a progression. That no, not necessarily. I mean, there is some progression. Obviously, students who are speaker as own listeners have to be speakers right. and listeners. But uh, with early learners, I find some of them might be a pre-listener but a speaker, yeah. or a pre-speaker but a listener. Yeah. And when I say when we say pre-speaker, it doesn't have to mean focally speaking. If even if you're using augmentative communication, you are still able to verbally communicate what your, what your wants and needs are, and you're still considered uh, somebody who is a speaker, right? You can use writing, you can use smoke signals, like whatever it is that works for you to communicate. Okay, good. So the curriculum that we set up for the students, it includes the range of behaviors within the context of their target setting events and their target antecedent and the consequences. So we look at all of those when we're designing curriculum for all of our students. The, the basic instruction that we use is called the Learn Unit, which we'll learn more today. Uh, and we set criteria and reference objectives to specify what degree of correct responding constitutes mastery. So if they don't master a certain goal, then we don't move them on until they master that goal. So a lot of focus on mastery. What is the Learn Unit? Uh, it is the basic teaching operation that we use. Uh, for those of you who are familiar already with the field of applied behavior analysis, then you know the, are all of you familiar with the three-term contingency? Yes, what does the three-term contingency include? So it constitutes uh, antecedent behavior and consequence. So the learn unit is pretty much almost the same, but the difference is that there are interlocking three-term contingencies. Right? So remember the word, the keyword interlocking. So there are two three-term contingencies for the teacher and one three-term contingency for the student. And interlocking because we're all working together. And the goal is to achieve instructional objectives using the smallest number of learn units possible. So like A is the antecedent or usually the, the direction or the stimuli that's presented to the student, right? The B is the behavior, which is what the student does, the student's response. And then the C is the consequence, is what we deliver to the students usually, whether it's praise, whether it's correction, uh, whether it's no, whether it's uh, whatever it is. So how is, it, how is a learn unit a little different? Okay, so here's an example of a learn unit for a correct response. So a student's response can either be correct or incorrect. 
So you have the attending student, right? That's another uh, important thing is that we need to have students who are attending to what we're doing as the instructor. If your student is looking sideways all over the place, then you probably cannot start, you can't even begin presenting instruction. So the attending student is for us as the teacher as, or the instructor is our antecedent, right? So the, I have a student who's attending, that's my antecedent to then say, hey, spell cat, which is in turn my behavior as the teacher, right? My behavior as the teacher is the antecedent for the student. So now the student hears, oh, I need to spell cat. So the student responds C-A-T. So when the student responds C-A-T, that's the student behavior, which is in turn my consequence that I hear my student responding C-A-T, which in turn become my antecedent to, do you think I provide praise or do I provide some sort of correction if the student responds correctly? Praise, very good. So that becomes my antecedent to say, oh, good job, and I record a plus on my data sheet. So that's my behavior. And then what I do is basically the consequence for the student. So now the student hears, oh, I did, I did it right. You know, C-A-T spells cat. Uh, and that is the completion of the learn unit, and that is my consequence. So do you see how we don't look at it as just A, B, and C, but they are interlocking, right? What, what the student does and what we do are interlocking three-term contingencies. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, Pat. Can I, can I ask a question? Of course. So uh, uh, that's very useful. Thank you for that explanation. Um, in, in, in functional terms, though, mm -hmm. in practical terms, how is this different from a discrete trial? It's not really, but I think we just have to look at it more that the behavior of the student also affects us as the instructor. No, fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that deep analysis is, is Right. Is useful. Right? Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, when I see a learned unit, I'm mm -hmm. not seeing anything that differs from what most people would call a discrete trial. No. I agree with you on that. That's why it, it does include like discrete trials or three-term contingencies. But I think when we look at it like this, then we also then pay more attention to how the student response affects what we do. Right? No, right? No. Yeah. Good. No, Thank for you. sure. Thank you. No, that's a good question. It is basically the three-term contingency. Um, yeah. It's just when we, again, like it's the interlocking part of it that we can pay attention to that. And because everything is learned or different and everything we do is based on how the student is doing at that particular moment, right, so. Is this gonna dissect it, um, or like uh, divide it into um, small com components? Uh, you know, discrete trial is divided and, and it's being seen from, from both perspectives. Well, I mean, in, ter in terms of the analysis, I appreciate the, that the analysis yeah. is, but again, the, in a functional sense, mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. at it, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. It is basically what it is. Okay. So, and then too, later on, when we sort of make, the, you know, there's a decision protocol that we use, when we try to identify why the student is not learning, then we can look at all of the various components, right? Is it, well, the student is not doing well because the student doesn't even attend to the teacher. Well, that could just be the start of your problem right there. Um, or maybe the teacher's behavior in the presentation of the antecedent, let's say Leah and I work together with the same student, I present it differently, Leah presents it a different way, well that could be an issue. So you can look at each individual component to determine why the student is not learning, right? Um, yeah, so sometimes it's, oh, this, you're asking the student to spell cat, but the student doesn't have focal verbal you know, the student can't speak. Well, well, maybe that is that. Well, that's obviously a huge issue already. So I think with this, then you can take a look at one of the, those little components to figure out why the student is not learning. So if this is a correct response, when the student uh, responds incorrectly, then we provide what we call a correction. So with this, again, you have the attending student, which is the antecedent, the teacher says spell cat. Now the student responds K-A-T. Right, which is an incorrect response. When there is an incorrect response, then what we do is we provide a correction procedure, which includes repeating the antecedent. So you say again, spell cat, and a prompt immediately. So we say spell cat, cat is C, oh, that's right, okay, spell cat, cat is C-A-T. So did I type that right? 
um, the student has to perform the correction. So now the student says, oh, okay, CAT. We don't deliver reinforcement and we just record a minus. And that is the completion of the learn unit. So we don't use, uh, I think it would be different, like we don't use the no-no prompt um, differently and we just provide a correction. And the, the idea is that we use differential reinforcement, right? When the student gets something right the first time, they get reinforced. When the student doesn't get something right the first time, they get a correction and then we just kind of move on to the next learn unit. So, yeah. Is the correction procedure flexible? I mean, I guess I'm asking because there's been, as you probably know, quite a lot of research in the past couple of years comparing yeah. correction procedures. Right, right. And the punchline is there ain't no one correction procedure that's better, no. that's better than any other. Right. And if the one you're using it isn't working, try another one. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering the extent to which the correction procedure is flexible in CABIS or is it quite fixed? No, I think it does because I think the other thing too, like which I'm not going to get into today, is that sometimes say we use errorless learning. So let's say we use zero second time delay procedure. So your antecedent and your behavior there already includes a prompt embedded in it, right? So that would kind of change how the correction would look like. Does that? I think there's. But I mean the the actual correction procedure, because I mean um, the the. There are, as you mentioned, no-no prompt as an option. Right, right, right. And right. again, there's research comparing no-no prompt yes. to this kind of procedure and to others showing right, that right. no-no prompt works better for some kids, other yeah. things work better for other kids, you know? So, we don't. We don't change it. We don't change the correction procedure. However, if we see the data, the student it, it's not working, then we do change. We add in a tactic. So we then change sort of the procedure. Yes, okay. yes, yes. But no, we don't change the correction. Now, another example of that. Oh, sorry. sorry no, go ahead. Say that we try something else, what else do you try? Then we, so for example, we look at the data, right? And we make decisions based on the data. And then if you see within several sessions, just based on the data, the student is not learning, then maybe we look into those different components that I was talking about earlier, right? Is, is the problem, is, is the consequence the problem? Is the student just not reinforced enough? Or the reinforcement doesn't hold any value? Like what you think is reinforcing is actually not reinforcing for the student. Is it, like is the antecedent flawed? Is the material, is the student's instructional history? Like all of those that we look into, into those more. I think too, like practically there's, there's some flexibility, like for, because sometimes when, you're working with like a really high level kid with a lot of language, you don't say anything to them at all after they get something wrong. A lot of them will be like, so what, was that right or wrong? Like they'll solicit their own feedback. So sometimes we have like a little bit of flexibility. Right, so right. The kids that, that we don't just sort of like silently say nothing at all. No. Technically we don't give any reinforcement or corrective feedback to them, but sometimes we say something. <laughs> yeah, we do, and I think the, the danger in that is that sometimes, like I find some of my BIs, for example, will say, oh, try again, and they will say, oh, good job, it gives exactly the same tone of voice. So I think for some of our students, they might not be able to discriminate mm -hmm. whether it was a reinforcement or not. So I think, uh, I know we don't say anything, we kind of just move on to the next one. I think for some of our students who are not able to discriminate those, that might just be cleaner that way, I think. But I agree. For some students who have more verbal behavior, then we can say, oh, that, yeah, that was a good try, buddy, and they already know it's like wrong, right? So, yeah, yeah. And some of my students, too, pick up on the data. Like, they know immediately when it's a minus. Like, we had to condition some of that. They saw minus, they're like, what? Ah! So <laughs> then we had to, you know, work on tolerating minuses, really, on data sheets. We have, many times. Um, so here's another example of a learn unit. So you have the antecedent clap hands, the student responds correctly, so you say good, you record a plus. So if the student then responds incorrectly and they stand up, then we reissue the antecedent and we say clap hands with a model, right? Either the student gets it correctly, it's still considered a minus for that learn unit. If the student still stands up, then we repeat it again with a higher level of prompting. So after clap hands with the model, the student still does it wrong, then you do clap hands again, but maybe with like a, you know, like a hand over hand prompt or whatever it is until the student performs the correction. 
And then that still constitutes one learn unit. And that's still one minus on your data sheet. So the learn unit, you know, they, it, it does tell us the moment-to-moment -moment results of instruction, right? You see immediately whether the students respond correctly or incorrectly. So you got a plus or a minus. And the criterion reference objectives tell us about more long-term outcomes. And it is a measure of student learning and is a fundamental measure of instruction because it is broken down into the smallest components. And the components can be, then be analyzed separately. I think like you said, uh, it's just broken down a little different from the sort of the regular three-term contingency and whatnot. Because then you can analyze the components separately and together for effective instruction. Um, it can be used to calculate cost effectiveness of a program. So within the schools, we take data on how many learn units the students receive per school day. We have data on how much instruction we as instructors provide per day. So we calculate the number of learn units that we deliver per day. And then we calculate weekly the number of criterion met, um, long-term goals that are met in a, a week. Uh, we calculate uh, sort of the average learning curve for our students every week. So we're able to see immediately um, how much it costs to run a program, really, right? You can calculate the cost per learn unit. <clears throat> and the number and the size of the learn unit varies by each individual student, depending on their level of verbal behavior. So an example of this, I think learn unit is then can become quite flexible because the size might be different for each student. Uh, we're going to do a learning unit activity where I'm going to show this example, but let's say we're teaching a student to tie their shoes, right? So we might use you know, forward chaining or backward chaining. Let's say we use forward chaining to tie their shoes. So in the first sort of short-term goal is that every step of tying shoes can be a learning unit, right? So you what do you do? You cross over. That's one learning unit. So yeah, okay, good job. You I don't know go under whatever it is, then that's another learn unit. Now, if the student is now able to do that step by step, your next goal could be, you know, you need to be able to tie your shoe completely and that becomes one learn unit. So now you're not reinforcing or correcting every step, but then as the student tie, like you just give the shoe to the student and say, tie your shoes. If the student ties their shoe independently and complete all, I don't know, 12 steps or whatever it is, then that would be one learn unit. So you only deliver correction or reinforcement at the end of it, mm -hmm. right? And then it could be the next step could be tie both shoes, could be one learn unit. And then eventually maybe get dressed and that becomes one learn unit. So the size will be different depending on, on the level of the verbal behavior of the student. So I find a lot of the students who are pre-speakers and pre-listeners and early listeners and early speakers do require all of the learn units broken down into very small components. So you will probably find their number of learn units per day, per school day, probably will be much higher than a classroom that has students who are readers and writers, right? Because then the size of the learn unit just differ. The research on learn unit uh, will tell you that the teacher must provide a consequence to the student's response and that's important. So we present clap your hands, the student claps and then we kind of just move on to the next one. It doesn't really produce a good learning outcome. Um, increasing three-term contingencies that result in higher rates of correct. So increasing the number of uh, three-term contingency trials will result obviously in higher rates of correct responses and incorrect responses remain low. Um, Another important component is that the student must observe the antecedent. And these are all studies from you know, early on, from early 80s, early 90s. So these are not, um, not a, you know, current research, but this is just something that we know already in the field of applied behavior analysis. Uh, the student must respond or have the opportunity to respond. Uh, if you guys are interested in a lot of the studies, I think in the, again, 80s with Greenwood, Hart and Risley and all of that, they do identify the importance of you know, the students in a classroom to have a lot of opportunities to respond, so. Uh, better student performance results from faster rates of intact learn units presentations. So there's a lot of studies out there, again, 80s and 70s, to show that when you present a lot of instruction problem behaviors, you know, not attending to the teacher, inattention, like those sort of problem behaviors in the classroom will decrease. And replacing student-teacher interactions that are not learn units with interactions that are learn units uh, have been shown to increase student correct responses four to seven times. 
So for this activity, I want to show you how the learn unit can change when you're teaching a student, right? So a student is learning to read. The current objective is for the student to read every word in a sentence correctly. So the sentence the student has to read is, this is from page one of the cat in the hat. The sun did not shine. It was too wet to play. Da, 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 da. So now, if, this, if you are teaching the student to read every word correctly, I want you to write down what the learn unit would look like. Remember, you, the student is still learning to read every word in a sentence correctly. And you don't have to define it in like the teacher, all of those components. Just what would the antecedent kind of be, what would be uh, the behavior would be, and when would you sort of reinforce or give correction to the student. Yes. The yes. Subject. Yes. Yeah. So right now the current goal is just uh, the student is able to do that, and now our goal is for the student to read every word correctly. Okay. The antecedent is the word presented on the page, right? So for example, the word the as it presented. You don't have to say anything. It's, it's right there. So a behavior would be the student <coughs> reads a word. So if the student reads the, if the student reads it correctly, then what do you say? Good job. Good job. That's right. Or if the student, instead of reading the, they read this, what do you say? Correction. Correction. And what would your correction kind of look like? The. the. That's right. You just basically point to the word and say this is the, right? So now the student is able to read every word in the sentence correctly. So net the next step is they met the criterion. So the current objective is for the student to read every sentence correctly. So this is still the same passage, right? The student can now read every word correctly. And now I want the students to read every sentence correctly. So what would the learn unit look like then? Go ahead. Sentence. The sentence, that's right. So the antecedent would be the sentence presented on the page. So instead of just saying the sun did not shine, now you want the student to be able to read the sun did not shine, right? That would be the thing. So if the student reads the sun did not shine correctly, what do you say? What do you say to the student? Good job. Good job, that's right. The student is reading the sun did not shine. If the student reads the sun did not um, shire, <laughs> the sun did not shire, then what do you, is that, what do you say? Correction. A correction, and how would you give the correction? The sun did not shine. That's right, the sun did not shine. And would you count that as a plus or a minus for the whole sentence, if the minus. student reads the sun did not shire? Minus. A minus, right? Even though there's multiple components in there. Yes, go ahead. Just to clarify, so if you're learning it as the whole sentence, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And you record the whole thing as a minus, right. right? So now, when you work with the student, you used to get maybe like eight, you know, thousands of learn units per day because every word is a learn unit. And now your number of learn units might be reduced to say 300 per day because now it's every sentence, right? So now the student is able to read every sentence correctly. The next step is for the student to read the whole page correctly and fluently. So the students need to be able to read at the rate of, say, 90 correct words per minute. This is sort of like first, second grade level. So this is one page that the student has to read. So how would you assign the learn unit? What would the antecedent look like? The whole page. The whole page, that's right. You just present the whole page, right? And what would be considered a correct response for the student? I'm sorry? Right, so they have to read the whole page correctly. That's right, very good. So if the student reads the whole page correctly, but the rate is not at the calculated rate, then you would consider that as a minus, right? So this, this learn unit activity, I just wanna show how the size of the learn unit can change depending on the student that you're working with. Um, 
Another example would be, for example, if you're teaching, like in a classroom setting, say, um, how to uh, double digit division or whatever it is. So the first step could just be teaching each operation, right? Like each time you do, like a step could be a learn unit, and then eventually completing the whole problem becomes a learn unit, and then eventually completing the whole page becomes a learn unit. So it just changes. The curriculum for our students are divided into four major repertoires. So we have academic literacy, communication, self-management, and expanding community of reinforcers. So academic literacy is basically, you know, we're teaching pre-academic skills from matching up to reading and writing and basic counting to math to like all of those. Uh, we focus not only in mastery but also fluency of basic skills. Uh, communication includes, you know, teaching man's tax interverbal responses and social sort of conversations and things like that. Uh, Self-management focuses on students managing their own behavior by teaching them not to emit stereotypical behaviors and or analyze the contingencies of environment, uh, in reinforcement and punishment in their own environment. Uh, we also work very hard on teaching students to acquire community of reinforcers. Uh, and what this means is that for a lot of our students diagnosed with ASD, they don't have a wide variety of reinforcers in their repertoire, right? Like they might like to play with some things or they might like to engage in stereotypical behaviors more than engaging in appropriate play. So we uh, make sure that we expand their community of reinforcers. And that is so important because when you go to any kindergarten classroom, what do they do most of the time here? They go to centers, right? Like all they do, well, not all they do, but most of the time they go to centers and then they have to engage in appropriate play. So it's important for our students early on to teach them to be able to do that um, first in a more controlled setting and in a, in a regular setting. The other thing too, that there is research to show that when books are conditioned as reinforcers, that means when a student enjoys looking at books, they learn to read faster. So we, you know, conditioning books is one of the, uh, you know, early sort of reinforcers that we try to condition from early on because we do know it does affect reading later on. We use the CPERC as our assessment. This is the CABAS International Curriculum and Inventory of Repertoire for Children from preschool to kindergarten. I will say though, even though I work with older students here that are beyond their kindergarten years, I still use the PERC because some of them, like I said, might be early learners, right? Even though they're in second or third grade, they might be a pre-speaker or pre-listener or early speakers and listeners. The, the C part that we use is a skills-based inventory. It is not a standardized test, meaning it doesn't compare the results of our student with the general population. It just tells us exactly what the student can and what the student cannot do. So if you guys are using the Phoebe map, that's another skills-based inventory. Um, the the AVOLs, right? That's an AVOLs and ABLES. Those are all skills-based inventory. Um, within the CPARC, there are 172 long-term goals for academic literacy. There are 16 long-term goals for community reinforcers, 57 long-term goals for self-management, and 56 for phys uh, physical development. And physical development includes small muscle, uh, which means like fine motor skills, graphomotor, classroom tools. Can the student use scissors? That will be another goal. Uh, and large muscles. Can the student run? Can the student jump, hop? Like, these are all skills that are needed to be in the classroom setting. So this is just an example of the perk. This is communication goals, early communication. So we have listener behaviors. Can the student, for pre-listeners, can they sit still for 10 seconds during instruction? And again, 10 seconds doesn't mean they have to sit down like a statue, right? It's just whether they're able to attend to the teacher delivering instruction. Can they maintain eye contact for three seconds? Um, so these are just examples of early communication goals. Oh, this will identify whether it's prosthetic reinforcers, whether they need some sort of edibles or tokens to maintain the behavior, whether it's generalized reinforcers, so social praise, or whether it's natural reinforcers. So natural reinforcers would mean they want to sit down just because they want to sit down, right? Like they don't require any other reinforcers. And then we just measure it. The criterion is uh, reflected in that too. So with, within all our schools, we start the initial assessment 
uh, in the first, you know, in the beginning of the school year, or if the student has been there for quite some time, their perk just get passed to uh, whoever teacher is working with them that year. So it just stays uh, in the school. Uh, this is an example of the expanding community of reinforcers that I was telling you about. So what I didn't put in is like before there, it will say that the student must play with these following items appropriately without emitting any stereotypical behaviors for 80% of the time. So, so we target you know, blocks, puzzles, coloring, Play-Doh, cost effect toys, books, TV even. Uh, can the students listen and respond appropriately to a story in a group setting? So these are all just community of reinforcers. Uh, these are just examples of early self-management repertoires that we try to target. So these are the school self-sufficiency. Can they stay in the play area? Can they line up? Can they follow classroom rules, sit quietly? Can they transition, move to different areas of the classroom without emitting tantrums? And these are more advanced self-management. So can they share toys, interact positively with peers? Uh, Focally respond to common occurrence, say bless you when somebody sneezes, right? So these are just some of our goals. It's a lot of goals. It's uh, assessing them usually would take at least a week and after, by then like we're able to start, but they're continually measured, right? Because as soon as they meet a long-term goal, then we can immediately just mark it down on the park and kind of move on to the next goal. So we don't wait until the end of the school year to uh, reassess the students. The individualized curricula, like I said, are all based on the CPARC assessment uh, and long-term objectives are created from there. So the LTO is the overall learning goal of a particular skill. And then every long-term objective is broken down into short-term objectives. So a breakdown into smaller steps and then mastering one STO will lead to next more complex STO and so on. We usually set the mastery criterion at 18 out of 20 for two consecutive sessions or days. And the reason why uh, we like to keep it consistent out of 20 across everybody. So that if I were to come in and I say, oh, he did 80% on this today. And then somebody comes in, oh, he also did 80%, uh, which sounds almost the same, but let's say, oh yeah, I only did four. So he got four out of, correct out of five, whereas another person might come in, oh, I did, I don't know, 40 out of 60 or whatever it is, then there's a difference in the number of learning unit presentations. So with this, we just graph everything out of 20 to make it consistent. Um, this is just an example of an LTO that I would write for um, you know, some of my clients here. So for example, if we want to teach the student to be able to tact different kinds of animals, that's a long-term goal. He needs 20 animals to learn and then every short-term goal is broken down into say sets of four animals, whatever it is. Data are collected for every student response, right? Based on the student's learn unit. So the size could be different. Um, that's why uh, it might change at all time. And like I said, teaching is driven by moment to moment responses of each individual student. So when you are taking data as you go, you are in contact with how your student is doing. You, you'll be able to see, oh, there's a lot of like minus, 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 like the first 10 already minuses. Something is not working here, right? Or if like, how come, from the data from the day before, he all got you know 20 or 18 pluses or whatever, and now with me, it's like 10 minuses. Oh, he was actually very sick this morning and has been throwing up all day. Okay, that could be the reason why. So when you're taking data as you go, I think you are in contact with what your student is doing. And because teaching is driven by moment-to-moment -moment responses of each individual student, I think that gives you sort of the feedback right away. Um, all data are graphed and decision protocol is used to determine student progress. So we do this also in you know, regular classroom settings. So when I taught kindergarten and second grade, they all learn how to take data on their own uh, pretty quickly, very early on. Um, so the kids are just able to identify a plus or a minus. They know when they meet objectives. Like they come up to me like, did I meet a criterion today? It's really, really, really fun. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and nobody gets upset with a minus. I think some of them cheat and lie, but we, we had a class discussion about that, so we're good. Okay, um, so this is just an example of the data sheet, again, out of 20, I'm moving on quickly, and this is an example of a 20 graph. So, let's move on to the decision protocol. Because we take data on every student response, Right? We also have a decision protocol that all of the staff in the school know how to follow. The reason why we teach this to every staff, and even here, even with my BIs, they know when to make decisions. Because they're the ones, or we're the ones who are in contact with the student at all times, and it is so important that we don't waste time. If we know the student is not learning, then we stop 
and we put in a tactic. If the student is learning, then great, we move on. Or if the student meets objective, that's even better, and then we can move on to the next step. So the decision protocols are taught to everybody. Uh, they are determined by trend of data path. So some of you uh, might be familiar with this. Uh, a data path is basically the line drawn between two data points. We begin the count uh, per phase of a graph from the point of origin, so the first data point in a phase. And once the student has achieved criterion, we change the short-term goal to move on to the next one. So here are some of the decision protocol rules. So we have three data path rules, and then we have five data path rules. So when the trend, when the direction is stable, so if you look at this, the direction is going up, up, and up, right? If you look at the graph. So that's what we call a stable trend of data path. Then we do a count of three. So this is one, two, three counts of stable trend. And is the direction going up or down? Up, ascending. So is the student learning or not learning? Learning. learning. So what do you think you will do if the student is learning? Do you continue or do you change it? Continue, continue. very good, right? Like you know the student is learning, so you continue. Okay, so now when it's three stable, right? Again, it's down, down, and down. Now the overall trend, is it up or down? Down. down. So, well, it says there, but what do you think you will do? Is it you continue or do you stop or change? Change, change. good, right? You know the student is not learning, so don't continue because the student, we know that the student will not, probably won't go up again, but. Um, if you see something like this, again, this is stable, right? Straight, straight, straight. Um, we call this a no trend data path and we also make a decision to change. So when we change, it doesn't mean that we just abandon the program completely. Now we have to think about what is not working and figure out how we can make it work better, right? So if we identify, oh, we've been using stickers, but the student doesn't like stickers as reinforcers. Well, maybe we need to change the reinforcement. So that's a tactic that we can put in place. Just changing the reinforcer could just be as simple as that, okay? Now, just to make it more complicated, uh, when there is a change on direction, so the ones that you saw previously all going the same direction, so if there's a change, so when the graph looks something like this, up, down, and straight, and you know, kind of going in all different directions, we do account up to five data paths, okay? So like this one, for example, if you look at the data paths, like it's up, down, up, straight, and then up, right? So we don't, like when you count to three, one, two, three, because you know there's a change in direction already, then you wait until a count of five. So you have one, two, three, four, five, and you will make a decision. And the overall trend is up or down? Up. up. So you would make a decision to continue. continue. Very good. So if you see something like this, again, so let's say you, count, you do a count of three, right? One, two, three, but the directions are all different already. So you wait until a count of five. So one, two, three, four, five. The overall trend is descending and you make a decision to change. Very good. This is a, what we call a no trend, meaning the data paths are going up, down, up, down, but they're pretty much sort of in the same range. So we also make a decision to change. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like on my actual programs. So this is an example of a student. We, I think, I believe we are teaching him, we were teaching him to identify family members, like pictures of family members. So I think the first one was mom and dad. So he met that pretty quickly, right? Like this STOA. So STOB, I think it's grandpa and his sister. So here, and these are showing, I think we we're using different, um, prompting strategies. But anyways, if you look at this one, one, two, three, right? Three stable ascending. So the BI made a decision there. She put her initial on the top to continue, right? Because it is three stable ascending. And then you have one, two, three, but because this is variable, so we wait till a count of five, but by that time he already met criterion because criterion is set at 18 out of 20 times two. So then we were able to move on to the next STO, right? So, and then this one here, same thing. And then that one, um, and sometimes we do a mix of all previously mastered or maybe to fluency and things like that. But this graph is just an example to show. Um, and these are all the BIs at home at the, and the home team that are making the decisions. Um, the, the BIs that I work with might not know 
which tactic to put in place when things are not going in the right direction, but at least they know we need to stop and they just send me a picture and then like, okay, is this a decision? If I say yes, then, you know, then we can try to figure out what to do next. Uh, this is another example of Sit still, I think, it's gotta be. So two seconds, five seconds, and then 10 seconds. So for this student, again, um, so for this one, there was an error, somebody missed a, a line, and one, two, three, four, five, and there was a decision to continue because if you look at the point of origin, it's sort of ascending, and we kind of continued on with that. And then this is just another example for responding to names. So just from one to three feet away, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So it was sort of ascending, right? But low, low responding, like the student was only getting up to five correct responses out of 10 for this one. Um, and then there was another decision, one, two, three, four, five. So uh, we made a decision to stop there. Again, just going back to the decision protocols, like I said, it is so important for the staff to be trained to do this because even though you're in a classroom, so the classroom setting would have one teacher, say with two teaching assistants, you might not work with that particular student every day, right? So when the staff are taught how to do this, then they're able to like stop what they're doing and then immediately say, okay, I think this is a decision, like what do we do? Or at the end of the day, then at least we can, we can do that. Uh, that's why it's important to teach you know, all of the staff how to make these decisions. Okay, so we finished talking about the student and now we're moving on to the teachers. Uh, so teachers here are, again, teachers also mean like instructors, you know, the behavior analysts that are working with the students. Uh, the teachers are strategic scientists of pedagogy and applied behavior analysis. Uh, we demonstrate, we need to demonstrate mastery in the following repertoires, so continuity shape repertoires in class practice, uh, the vocabulary of the science or the concepts of terms of the science, and verbally mediated repertoires, which means expertise in analyzing and solving instructional problems. So these are the three repertoires that us as teachers need to master to become um, the strategic scientist of learning. So when we characterize learning problems from the scientific perspective, instead of saying, you know, the student is not motivated then we look at it at the reinforcement or the EO is not in place. We say it is inadequate for the student or we say the student does not have a wide community of reinforcers. He only likes to play cars and that's it. And when you've been playing with cars for you know, eight hours of the day, then it's probably no longer work as a reinforcer, right? So these are the, the way we have to think as a strategic scientist, we need to shift the way we think. Um, instead of saying the student has a learning disability, well, yes, the student might have a learning disability, but what can we do? Oh, we need to look at the prerequisite repertoires. Maybe some things are not mastered. Some things are not fluent. The student can't read because they don't know letter sounds. So these are things that we, we need to look into. Or rather than just saying the child can't learn, we need to instead say the instruction is adequate. Maybe he, the student just hasn't had enough learn units or three-term contingencies presented. Uh, maybe the controlling variables are, you know, need to be shifted. The student hasn't learned the stimulus control for you know, that particular behavior or whatever it is. And rather than saying the problem is in the home, we need to say that instruction in the school is the responsibility of the teacher. And we are responsible for fixing the problem, right? The student is always right, good. So what are contingency shaped repertoires for the teacher? So these are teaching practices in the classroom. These are behaviors that are reinforced or punished directly by contingencies in the environment. So presenting learn, learn units is once it, they become fluent, presenting learn units become fluent is basically a contingency shaped repertoire. You immediately provide reinforcement for correct responses and you provide a correction for incorrect responses, right? That becomes contingency shape, uh, could become contingency shape. So these are fluent behaviors in the classroom. So teachers who don't have fluent contingency shape repertoires, they provide flawed instruction. They neglect to allow the student opportunity to respond. They neglect to reinforce or correct target responses. And they don't remediate student learning problems and don't present learn units and do not teach to mastery. So how do we as teachers or instructors learn contingency shape repertoires? Through in-situ teaching or like teaching as you're working with the student. You present intact learn units and without error. You reinforce frequently, contingently, and positively. 
uh, I will also say that you know at Teachers College, some of the in, some of the individuals who came into the program uh, never even heard of ABA before. I mean, well, that was maybe when I started, right? So I guess years ago. Um, so they're not familiar with ABA, so they are used to certain classroom practices that are that can look very different with what we do as pr practicing behavior analysts. So one of the steps for those teachers who came into the program and started working with the students, they were not even sort of allowed to present learn units in the first few days, and they just had to present approvals to the students. 800 approvals per day. 800, and like you have a clicker, and then you just count how many approvals. And that's just to get you used to presenting approvals in the classroom, because it is a positive classroom, right? And catching good behaviors. So after some time, you just get used to like, you're sitting so nicely, you are playing nicely. Oh my gosh, you are sharing your toy. And it, you, it just becomes automatic, it becomes contingency shape. Um, you learn to record and display data. You use TPRA to measure teacher progress, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, so initially, we, uh, you know, sort of the instructors or the teacher are under complete supervision and support of a supervisor. and. Our behaviors initially will be rule governed, right? Like we have to think, okay, the student emitted a correct response, what do I do? Oh, I praise. The student just emitted an incorrect response, what do I do now? Oh, I need to provide a correction. So initially, everything that you're doing is kind of just like driving, right? Initially when you're driving, you're like, oh, wait, I need to turn, I need to do this, I need to do that. But after a while, it becomes, the behaviors become fluent, and then the presentation of learning units also become fluent. So. When the practices are initially dictated by verbal instruction, it comes under the control of the student behavior, they become contingency shaped, and they become accurate and automatic or fluent. So one of the ways uh, to train our, you know, to provide sort of supervision to our teachers is by the use of TPRA, and this is teacher performance rate and accuracy. Remember when I said that everybody has data, like everybody collect data, not just on the students, but on us? So the supervisors would then come into the classrooms and take data on us presenting instruction to the students. Um, and this is called the TPRA. So we measure whether the learn units presented are accurate or not. And then the decision protocol and then is used to monitor the degree to which we are acting as strategic scientists. We also need to master verbal behavior about the science or basically the basic terminologies um, of the science. And this is important too, because in the field that we're in, we all kind of speak the same language, right? So if I were to come in and I say, uh, we're using reinforcement with the student, just a basic example, we all know what reinforcement, reinforcement means. So it's just important that we all know the, the Phoebe about the science and the terminologies. So, and then when we know the Phoebe about the science, then we're able to use that to solve instructional problems. Right? So we identify the problem within the learn unit context. We identify an appropriate tactic from research, not just research from CABAS, but just research of a in ABA in general. We apply the tactic to correct the problem, and then we collect data to measure the student progress or lack of progress. So if the tactic doesn't work, the data show us the tactic is not working, what do we do? We change, yeah, you change it, and you find another tactic. So this is just uh, how we see the learn unit in context. I'm not gonna get into this, um, but we have basically, and I think if this has been drawn as sort of like circles would have been better, it's just a little confusing, but we look at the, the, the learn unit of the student, right? So again, when the student is not learning, we identify whether it's the SD, the response, or the consequence. Where, where does the issue lie? And then we look at the level of behavior, verbal behavior of the student, we also look at the setting events, the EOs, and then we look at instructional history, uh, the phylogeny, we, obviously we can't change that, but we take a look at the student sort of learn unit context to figure out where the learning problem might occur and try to fix it that way. So when we try to apply tactics, uh, there are over 200 learning tactics available in the literature. Again, these are all um, just your research in ABA, uh, we learn to identify these tactics and apply them to the problem. And these tactics will include behavior management, right, and learning tactics. So we're not just managing behaviors, but we're also making sure that the student learns. So an example of the tactics, and this is just straight from designing teaching strategies, um, this is just the first page, but 
again, even just tokens, that's a tactic, reinforcer, uh, peer mediation, DRO, DRA overcorrection, um, brief motivation procedures to establish EO, is it thinning reinforcement, is it teaching mans, is it good behavior ribbon, which was like a study from the 70s, right? So all of these are just examples of tactics that we might use with our, with our students. So. Okay. Any, any questions so far? No? We're good? Okay. Um, our teachers, in order for them to master all of those components, also have to go through the teacher ranks. So there's teacher one, teacher two, master teacher, and the rest. Uh, so I'm just, these are, so all staff members at the schools must work on their ranks. For, in us, for us, when we were in the program, in order for us to get our grade, we have to complete a particular rank. Uh, in the schools, in order to get pay raises, they have to complete ranks. So it's all contingent based on our performance. Uh, the, the tier one rank requires mastery of the terms and concepts in texts that are scientifically accurate. Uh, we also acquire in situ repertoires to show errorless and rapid presentation of learn units. Uh, and then it includes accurate decisions that are verbally governed um, by selecting from the tactics that we just talked about. So this is an example of a teacher one rank that we had to complete in our first year of our master's program. So module one, there's 10 modules in each rank. So for this one, remember we talk about the three different repertoires of the teacher, right? The first one is the verbal behavior about the science. We need to master basically the, the ABA Bible, Cooper, Heron, and Heward, um, and Catania's book. Um, so just the first module, we have to master unit one, which includes chapter one and two of Cooper, and then chapters one to four of Catania. So this is one module. So this is the verbal behavior about the science, and this is the contingency shaped teacher repertoires, right? So can the candidate meet the learn unit criterion of um, for say 25 days, usually like it goes by month, can you deliver 600 learn units per day accurately? So those are the goals of the teacher ranks. Within the same module, we also have verbally mediated repertoire. So Remember, it means like you derive from research and you try to apply it to learning problems. So one of that would be, can you do a data collection showing an AB relationship or a functional relationship? Completion of research summaries, 15% or fewer decision errors, and daily submission of accurate data. So these are just from module one, and then there's 10 of them. So by mastering this, we are making sure that teachers become strategic scientists, right? Like, you know, when you work directly with the student. Last part of the presentation, I just want to talk about the characteristic practices of teaching as applied behavior analysis. And I think this is just a really nice summary of everything that we've talked about in this presentation. Um, again, all instruction is individualized, whether it's provided in one-to-one -one setting or in groups. Uh, teacher continuously measure teaching and student responses, and we talk about this, right, with the decision protocol and all of that. Um, we have graphs of the measure of students' performance, and we use those to make decisions about which tactics are best for students at any given point. We use logically and empirically, empirically tested curricula and curricular sequences are used. So even within the CABA system, even though we use the CPARC as one of our assessments, we also use EDMARC. We use a lot of direct instruction curricula, so we use a lot of those um, within the programming that we do. Um, the principles of basic science of the behavior of the individual and tactics from the applied research are used to teach educationally and socially significant repertoires. Again, teaching is driven by the moment-to-moment -moment responses of each individual student and existing research findings. The classroom is a positive reinforcement. Uh, the classroom is uh, a positive environment, so we don't use any coercive procedures. Uh, so that means reprimands are not used, and that's why we all had to master being able to deliver praise or approvals, what, you know, 800 per day. Um, we consider expertise in the science to use, um, we use that to make moment-to-moment -moment decisions based on collection of data, so we talk about that also. Teachers are strategic scientists of pedagogy and applied behavior analysts, right, based on the mastery of those ranks. And the progress of students is always available for a few in the form of up-to-date graphs. So, you know, in every classroom, the student has their own learn unit graphs, the teachers present their graphs, and then um, the school as a whole showed their weekly graphs. So everything is presented. So 
if somebody were to walk into the school, they're able to see right away, just even for the whole school, how the whole school is doing, right? If you see the whole school has a, like, nobody in the school has been meeting long-term objectives, then something is not working, for example. And then when you go to the classrooms and you also see the graphs of the teachers and the students, our TPRA graphs, that means our performance were also presented on the graphs and you know the supervisor can just come in and check. So yeah, so that is basically all of this that I think we talk about are all summarized into what teaching as applied behavior analysis could look like. The student is always right. So that's what uh, we need to keep in mind. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.